Alrighty, so if anybody has played an old school RPG before, you know that the world is flat and it goes on forever. So if you try to go to the end of the world, you're going to get warped back to the beginning of the world. If we go through there, where will we be? On the bridge. But we are on the bridge. So we're going to recreate that um, using this Final Fantasy VI uh, example project that I've been using for other tutorials. So one thing I want to get right out of the gate is it's not absolutely perfect and undetectable. I end up getting this tiny flicker when it moves the position. I'm going to blame Godot because otherwise I'd have to blame me. And No. So the approach I'm going to take here is there's a collider on each edge of the map here. The sprite, rather. Not really a sprite because it doesn't move, but you know what I mean. Um, so here we've got a collider at each edge. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to hide the top one to explain this bit here. So this is the left collider. So the logic in the code is going to be body got into this collider when you exit that collider only in this direction which we're going to use the velocity to determine um, that's when it's going to warp to the other side the reason i have it extending above the north edge of the map here again this is the left collider uh, but there's also the top collider which is on the edge here and if they cross this line in this spot that if you don't extend the collider you'd be crossing both the left and top colliders at the same time, and we do not want that to happen uh, for obvious reasons. So again, here's the top collider, just to illustrate. Same thing here, top collider. We do not want to trigger the top collider when going past this edge to the left. So that way, essentially what you have is the only way they could actually cross both colliders at the same time is if they nailed this exact pixel um, and are traveling diagonally. I don't think that's impossible, but it's really rare. I'm going to at least call it a corner case. <laughs> so again, the general approach here um, in the signals over here, uh, we have body exited. Uh, so anytime one of those is exited, it's going to uh, talk to the warp character with whatever direction uh, for each of those. And I've done this in other tutorials, but just to show how you connect those, um, let's say you're on the um, area 2D that you want. Uh, double click on body exited then go to uh, you know the node that you have the script on in my case it's the overworld script and then pick the method and warp character top is the one i want as always make sure that the signature or the things you are passing in the character node uh, the node 2d rather in this case that has to match so when you connect that um, your method as well if i find it uh, the method also has to take in a node 2D. And also remember that if you just wrote your method in the code, that the project has to be built first. That hammer up there will build it. So it will not show up in those methods to pick unless you've built it. You can type it in manually, though, if you want to. Anywho, so the first thing we need to address is, um, so we're, we decided we're going to warp the character to the other side as they're approaching the map. But what happens when you know the character is walking just before the edge of the map they're going to see this gray void over here we don't want that either so um, i'm drawing a copy of this sprite in all of the eight directions surrounding the center sprite and they will never get to the edge of those outer sprites because they're getting warped but this way as they approach it they'll never see an edge like that and by the way you'll see the like i was showing before you see i have lines drawn on the edge of the sprite i just edited the sprite as an example here that way for this demonstration we can clearly see when we're approaching the edge and test that uh, but normally you would want to make that as seamless as possible obviously so we're going to look at the code now so first to do that drawing we're going to store the overworld sprite in this variable i'm storing basically everything i can in a variable because again we want this to be as undetectable as we can make it and the more you have stored in memory the quicker it's going to work so right here, we're storing the overworld sprite, just get node, sprite to the name of your sprite. That stores it in that variable. Now the draw method um, is, I believe, only called once unless you explicitly call it again. And that, you know, like it sounds, it draws stuff. So um, this is going to set these, the sprites width in the upper left corner and lower right corner coordinates basically it's storing those in the variables as well and i'm storing those in variables because in those warp methods we're going to use those values and also just anytime you reuse something you typically want a variable so you don't have to do it in two spots 
So this is just going to take uh, texture in. So you get the sprite, it has the texture as a property here. And then all you're really doing is giving it two coordinates. That's all this mess is. But um, if you follow this, it's draw drawing the uh, copy of the sprite, like I said, in those eight directions. One thing to be sure of is if you're doing it the same way I'm doing it, I set the origin of the sprite to the upper left corner. So I make that an easy reference to, you know, to reference the other sprites. And you can see that here on the overworld sprites right up in the upper left corner so make sure that's the case another thing i want to talk about quickly is the physics layers so theoretically this works regardless but again we want to keep what godot has to do to a minimum so on these area 2ds i'm using the encounter controller which is also used for the battle areas i did in the you know random encounters tutorial um you probably if i were getting serious with this i'd want to separate that even to its own collision layer um, just to make sure but that but that's the general theme here is you know minimize the work Godot has to do on these collisions because if you want it to be super fast then it speaks for itself so again and this is uh, locked to, as a refresher this is the encounter uh, collider really so I changed this to a circle collider um, the reason for that is I want it to be perfectly symmetrical like I don't want when lock crosses one side of the map uh, I don't want it to, you know, look different somehow than if he crosses the other side of the map because of an asymmetrical collider. But this is still the same collider used for the random encounters. Um, but again, it could be on its own collision layer. You could add another body if you needed to. And also, just to keep it very small, if you have a large collider, what would happen is if as you exited, you know, in a particular direction, like let's say the collider were taller, like a, a tall rectangle and uh, much taller than it were wide then he would warp to the other side of the screen a little before he was actually you know before his feet i guess were actually on this line and going left and right he would not so i would keep that collider symmetrical as the tldr there so something else um i've put in here is you'll notice async in the methods for the uh, warp character methods and i put this option wait for physics now that is right here i just exported that so you see that in the editor so if i click on the overall node here where the script is you see wait for physics i have it checked on this one yeah I, I, it's hard to tell if it makes a difference but it's something we can experiment with um, but what it's actually doing is we're waiting for the next physics frame let me get rid of this draw method here so we um so here we're saying if that option is checked we're going to await the next physics frame. So the node 2D that's going to get passed in, um, that's going to be that encounter body. That's one thing to make sure we keep straight. So within lock, I have this encounter body 2D so that we can have a separate collider for these interactions as opposed to the collider that's actually stopping him from walking through a mountain if I were to actually do that. Um, so same thing as random encounters tutorial, that's, um, that's why we're using that. We want a tiny little area to matter here. So the, uh, so the character node that's getting passed in, again, it's, it's really that encounter body. The owner is Locke himself in this case. So that gets us the character. That's what the, the node we're actually going to change the position of. That's why I need to do that. Um, this, uh, and again, these are variables to keep it fast as possible. Uh, we're storing the velocity as well because we need to know if we're exiting one of those colliders in the direction we're interested in. And the new X position and Y position, we're just getting where they should be. So like this, if they're going across the top, we're not changing their X value. We're only changing their Y in that case. So if I were just to say lower right Y and none of this, what I'd be doing is putting him on the exact bottom line of the map. But we're also, he's moving, right? So if we do that exactly, it's going to jitter because it's actually going to pull him back however far Locke would have traveled in that frame. So the way we compensate for that is we go to the bottom edge and then give him a little bump however far he would have moved in that single frame. So the velocity is, you know, pixels per second, and then we're going to divide that by uh, frames per second. I think I said that right. Shoot me if not. And about that warp movement offset, that's going to be your frame rate, basically. So I set it to 60. Um, this is another one that I'm not sure if it helps. So right now I just set that variable. Again, a variable that doesn't have to get every warp, so it's already there, speed reasons. Um, there is this method, uh, get frames per second it has to be cast uh, as a float because we're dividing it um 
we're dividing the character velocity by it, which uh, this character velocity y, that's a float. So there's no point in this being a double, which is what uh, frames per second returns. So this, this will be more often than the physics frame actually, but the variable is, you know, so if your frame rate drops, this should theoretically compensate for it. But obviously this, you know, takes some modicum of processing as well. So that's why I'm a little iffy on that, but you could do either one. So if you just got rid of this, then you would just be using the 60 that that variable gets defaulted to or whatever your frame rate is so yeah tldr yeah this is the bottom edge plus however far Locke should have moved past that bottom edge in the frame that we're taking to set his position so here and we're only going to actually set that position if the character velocity y is greater than zero so again Sorry, less than zero. Remember to invert the y-axis. So this just says he's moving up. You know, again, like I said, this enforces the direction. And then we set the character's global position to this new x and y position. And all the rest of these methods do are the same thing, just for different edges. I'll briefly show them if you just want to copy verbatim. Um, but I'll, you know, commit it to the repo as well. And you can see here, so like on the left, instead we're mess. the x position is the one we got to mess with. Um, we, you know, with the frame changes and stuff like this. And actually, I need to get rid of it. I think I was experimenting because it was when I, when I was jumping around. So I should just, I shouldn't have the sprite width there. Again, we're just correcting for that frame movement. So let's give it a try. And the reason I'm not getting into battles here is just because in the code, I just have it do nothing if there's not a battle area you're in. So it only goes into battle with one of those um, areas I defined in that tutorial. So here you see the edge. I'm going to start going over it there. Here we go. So that's I mean it's pretty good, but you do see that tiny flicker. And I've made sure to set the Y position or the Z index, whichever it is. Um, yeah, see there, it's not like you can break it. I don't know exactly what does it. So this is where you would really test the heck out of this. So right at the corner here, we're so right here we're in the upper left corner, and then yeah, that's pretty nice. But yeah, if you really abuse it, yeah, it's, like I say, it's not perfect, but it's darn close. Yeah, it didn't even flicker that time, so I don't know what it is that causes that flicker. Yeah, there it is, a few few times. So, you, you know, you can play with it, uh, but in general, yeah, like, this will give you a way to warp your character to the other side of the map without having infinite coordinates. And the other advantage, I think, is that if you're... Um, if you have a bunch of objects in your world, you know, like I'm, I'm again taking the non tile map approach just because then you can just draw something, put nodes, put, you know, anything you want in this world and you just have one object to deal with. And that that way you can not have to worry. Like, let's say you did want to break this up and you wanted to draw chunks of the world, which I think is another approach done in tile maps. Um, then you got to keep in mind if you let's say you had a collider, like a battle area that crossed over this. Um, you know, crossed over one of your chunks, then you got to break that up into two colliders. You got to worry about nodes or any other logic breaking. Now, again, that's predicated on doing it the way I did it. So obviously, you know, if you were taking the tile map or some other approach, those things may be irrelevant. But I think this is a good way to, you know, uh, quickly get something up and running.